Okay, next up this morning, we have the Policy Implementation and Experience Report. Richard Jimerson will give it. Thank you, John. I am Richard Jimerson with Aaron. Um, CIO, currently uh, the Interim Director of Registration Services as well. I'm here to give you the Policy Experience Report this morning. The purpose of the Policy Experience Report is to uh, review existing policies that have been set by you, the community, as the Aaron staff is the entity that implements the policies that you set. We don't uh, comment on the merits of the policy proposals and the discussions that you have. Uh, it's very clear that the only people in the community who cannot uh, set policy inside the region is the Aaron staff. But over time, the community has asked us to give this policy implementation and experience report to share with you the uh, things that we've seen from the customers who are making the request for the resources. So what we'll do is we'll go over anything that appears to be ambiguous uh, for the customers inside the policy text, anything that might be inconsistent for them, or there might be gaps uh, of effectiveness and those types of things. Uh, it could also identify areas where newer modified policy may be needed. And it does look at operational experience that we're hearing from the customers in relation to the policies that have been passed and the feedback that comes for them. We hear feedback from them on a daily basis. And we like to share that information with you today. So we provide this feedback to the community and make any recommendations where appropriate. So what you'll find in the four that we're bringing here today, we have NRPM 5 for AS number policy, and then the other three are transfer related. Uh, that probably is not a surprise to anyone in the room. Um, we don't have specific recommendations for all of these, and I do want to note that we're bringing these to you because these are the items that we're receiving the most friction from and communicating with customers uh, over the last six months. But the policy set that's in place today, we're finding, has effectively brought us through depletion in September of last year and has helped us through in the transition to the transfer uh, phase of registration services that we're in now and that Really, uh, what's there, uh, you guys have protected everything that we've needed. There have been times where we've had some difficulty and we've had to sit down as, as a team and evaluate something. We'll sit down with Mr. Kern and do that. And we'll find that you guys thought about that through the policy process over the years. And what we needed is right there in the policy manual. Uh, but with that, we do have a few items we'd like to discuss. One of them is AS number policy. The existing criteria you can see here, this existing criteria has been there since the 1990s. Uh, it basically states that organizations can receive an AS number, a public AS number unique from Aaron uh, under unique routing policy if its policy differs from its border gateway peers or if it's a multi-home site. And that served us very well. However, there are a few uh, request cases that may not exactly fit into those criteria. Um, some, of them have argued, some customers have argued that they do, and other customers have worked hard to conform to what they see inside the policy right now. And it could be argued that some of these things fit under unique routing policy, but we wanted to bring them to you and get guidance from you just to be sure, rather than just making the decision on the fly ourselves going forward. So some of those uh, uh, situations are, one is cloud services. Uh, customers indicate that cloud service providers require that they have a public AS number to participate in that service. And also, a distributed denial of service or uh, disaster recovery purposes. Organizations are setting up backup or parallel networks that aren't con uh, continually in use, that are only there in case they get attacked where they want to switch over uh, to the uh, new network, or uh, in cases of disaster recovery if there's ever a problem inside that space. So I wanted to let you know that we are seeing those cases. And uh, at the end of the presentation here, I'm happy to hear any guidance that you might have as the community on how we should handle those. But I do want to tell you that what we're doing today is we inform the requesting organization that uh, the request doesn't meet the criteria and restate the criteria from NRPM to them. Many modify the request to comply with the multi-home criteria and produce agreements or letters from two providers to successfully complete the request process. Some have dropped the request. Uh, some have come back and successfully uh, shown us that it is unique and we've accepted those, but that's not typical that they do that. They usually try to go back and conform to the policy. And the frequency of these requests have increased over the last year. We're seeing somewhere between 5 to 10 percent is either for cloud services requirement or for disaster recovery or, or denial of service uh, type reasons. 
and they're becoming less atypical, so we're, we're seeing them more and more, and it's uh, becoming common. So I wanted to let you know about that. Uh, the next one I wanted to talk to you about is NRPM 8.3. This is the policy that allows organizations to transfer address space where one organization has excess IPv4 and they want to act as a source to provide that to another organization who is acting as a specified recipient who needs the IPv4 address space. Uh, the source, of course, we vet the source to make sure that that organization is authoritative before we allow them to release the space. And for the recipient, we apply a needs assessment in accordance with policy to that organization. Here's the scenario that we've seen a couple of times, and companies have come to us and indicated that it is an issue for them, so I wanted you to know about it. So, a company plans to transfer per NRPM 8.3 their existing class B or slash 16 IPv6 address block. This is a sample scenario. So basically, this is an organization that got a class B back in the 1990s, and they're a very small provider somewhere, and, and they don't really need this whole B. Maybe they're only using a 24 or a 23 out of it, and they have found someone. Someone has come to them and said, I want that class B slash 16 address space, and I want the whole thing. And the person who's giving it up needs to keep a 24 of that or a 23 of that. But the person who is taking it from them says, no, I want the whole thing. So that creates a situation where they have to come obtain their own 24 or their own 23 of IPv4 address space. So the issue that they're having is the organization can't pre-qualify for a slash 24 if they currently hold a fully unused slash 16. Although qualification is highly likely, giving existing usage, we, we can't pre-qualify them for that because they currently hold the slash 16. And the organizations are attempting to, to time their 8.3 recipient and their source tickets at the same time. And this is the problem that they're having. So they, we understand, as the, air, the people in this room probably very well understand, and the Aaron staff very well understand, that once they source that slash 16 to an organization, it's going to be very easy for them to qualify for that 24 or that 23 if they're already use a lot, utilizing that space. And it's going to be quick, and it's going to be easy for them to do that. But they have a concern, and their concern is that's not a guarantee for them. So what they're trying to do is come in and get that pre-qualification. And what we're telling them, we can't give them a pre-qualification that's conditional. Um, they're nervous that if they release the 16 to the other organization, that they will not later be able to get the 24 or the 23 that they need. We try to reassure them that they can do that, but it's a trust issue and, and they have some concerns. So I wanted you guys to know about that, and that's actually happening today. Some of them are pretty savvy. What they'll do is they'll come in and they'll create a new organization ID, and they will request pre-qualification under that new organization ID so that it's considered separate from the 16 under that organization, and they'll move forward. But others don't realize that they can do that, and they might be sitting on the outside, not even coming to us, telling us about it. And so we have no way to advise them. So I wanted to let you know about that. Another one we have is 8.3 recipient complaints. We're not necessarily asking the community to do anything about this. We just wanted to let you know that this is happening. And we want to let you know what we're doing as the staff in these cases. So the issue is customers are receiving IPv4 blocks through NRPM 8.3 transfers. And then sometimes later they notice that um, the block that they received is being filtered as a result of being listed by spam mitigation service providers. They're on a block list somewhere, and that space is just not working out for them. So they'll come back and they'll make a complaint to Aaron. Well, what we tell them and we want the community to know is that Aaron staff verifies the authority of the NRPM 8.3 transfer sources, and we conduct a need assessment for 8.3 transfer recipients. So for the source, all we're doing is making sure that they are the authoritative organization who can release that address space to another organization. They are the registrant. And for the recipient, we're applying the needs assessment test as required by policy. We may notice that it's on a block list, the space. We may notice that there's something interesting about that space, but we do not notify anyone about that because that is not our role. That's not, a, that's not what we've been asked to do and we're not doing it. So I do want to let you know that staff does not review or advise 8.3 recipients of IPv4 block quality. And the quality of a given block is subjective based on the recipient and their intended use. We're not basically warning people about the space that they're receiving if we see something wrong with it. I wanted to let you know about that. And the final one that I have here is NRPM 8.4. This is the transfer between regions 
where either the source is in the urine region and the recipients in the ripe or the apneic region are the reverse. Some customers are attempting to transfer via NRPM 8.4 AS numbers. Aaron staff interprets uh, NRPM section 8.4 to only pertain to IPv4 blocks. So uh, what we have here is Aaron staff is asking, are we properly interpreting NRPM 8.4 to not include AS numbers? And also, is it desired by the policy community AS numbers be transferable via NRPM 8.4? And we would like to hear what you think about that. So those are the four issues that we have, and, um, and the microphones are open, and we're happy to take any questions or comments that you have. Sure. Charles Gucker, VMware. When, uh, more clarification, when you're talking about the cloud services, um, are you talking about cloud services end users or cloud service providers? So we're talking about uh, users of a cloud service. So there's a large organization out there, they have a cloud service that's available, and this is a, a participant, someone who wants to participate, a customer of that cloud service who wants to participate in it, and they're being told by their cloud service provider that uh, they will not accept a private AS number. And we're not sure if that's because they're concerned about collision and the large number of participants that they have inside of that or if there is another reason. And we've actually seen in the documentation from some of the larger cloud service providers that they require that their customer use a publicly assigned uh, AS number for that service, but it doesn't really provide an explanation as to why, and the customers are coming to us with that. Okay. Front microphone. Owen DeLong. O Owen DeLong, Aaron AC, Akamai. Um, I think that each of those is a, a case of a unique routing policy, and I'd like to uh, see perhaps guidance given to staff that they explain that concept to the applicant and go ahead and process the request rather than saying, well, you're not multi-homed, go away, um, which I've seen be basically the feedback some of the applicants have gotten, uh, and then I had to explain to them the concept of unique routing policy and tell them how to resubmit their paperwork. So um, I think that we can make the process friendlier without needing any changes in policy. Uh, the cloud service providers do have legitimate reasons. Uh, having been on the other side of that somewhat, um, uh, there's a f number of different issues that come up when you start getting 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 customers all trying to peer with you using a private AS number and you're having to advertise those further out to the internet and strip off private ASs and then you get entertaining loops between your customers and all kinds of other fun things. Uh, so it, it really is a bad scene if you're trying to run a cloud service and peering with a bunch of customers on private AS numbers. It just uh, leads to all kinds of trouble that you don't want, uh, not just the issue of collision. Um, so I did want to address a few of the other topics, but John seems to be anxious to talk, so I will defer to him. Um, we're happy to change how we respond to these atypical requests, but I guess I'm trying to seek clarification. Do you believe that these requests qualify under the current policy and we're implemented it incorrectly? Yes. Okay. Um, so if that's the case, I, I would love to hear um, clarity from that. I'll, I'll take it from the AC as a consensus point and we'll refresh the implementation, but um, I'm the wording of the policy and the history of it doesn't necessarily make that clear. And so we've looked at this pretty hard and um, the language of the policy as written wouldn't support what you just said. You don't need to change policy, but just let's have the AC tell me clearly I, I, we made a mistake here. Well, I believe it does rep meet the, the letter of what is written because they are advertising a different set of networks to their upstream cloud service provider than what are advertised in general by their cloud service provider they therefore do have a unique routing policy, even though they are not multi-homed. We will look at that. Okay. Um, the 8.3, uh, we, we got a block that was owned by spammers complaints. Yeah, too bad, so sad. Um, you know, do your due diligence before you buy something, caveat emptor. Uh, the 8.4, no, you shouldn't be transferring ASNs. That's clearly not what the policy says you're supposed to do and you're doing exactly the right thing. All right, thank you for those comments. Uh, back microphone. Jason Chiller, Google, uh, NRO, NC. 
if you could go back to the first set of slides about the ASNs. Um, I think in the second case, where it's disaster recovery, that's clearly a discrete network. It's clearly, they're trying intentionally to build a parallel network that is diverse, that has no single points of common failure. They're, they're clearly trying to set up a discrete separate network. And I think that that should definitely clearly fit in the definition of uh, a discrete routing requirement. In the first case, if the cloud provider requires an ASN, I think it is best practice to not use a private ASN. Because if there is a, another organization downstream that's responsible for the routing, that should be clear to the rest of the routing system. And if it's a private ASN, that would be stripped at the EBGP boundary, and it would look like the upstream provider is in control of those announcements and responsible if something bad is happening, say, like a route is flapping. What's not clear to me is why the cloud provider is requiring an ASN at all, and I would love to hear from cloud providers why that's needed, um, but certainly if there's a good case for that, I would say that it should also certainly fit in the requirements. Um, on the second one about blocks which are blacklisted, um, I'd just like to say to the community, you're welcome. Um, and I'm saying that on behalf of all of the large organizations that over the years, when Aaron had flexibility for choosing which block to assign to a customer, they typically gave the dirty, messy ones to the large organizations. And we worked through our legal departments and through our routing and putting important stuff on those blocks and making it not reachable uh, to get those blocks cleaned. And I'm sorry that you are now sharing in that pain. I wish you the best of luck. Um, and the final question, yeah, I don't think ASNs need to be transferred. We're, we're not out of ASNs at this point. Um, really, the only case an ASN should move hands is if the network is moving hands, if it's kind of an M&A type of arrangement. Thank you. Thank you, rear microphone. Um, David Farmer, University of Minnesota, Aaron AC. Um, on the last point here, the part of the source of the confusion, I think it comes from the fact that AP NICS ASN transfer policy also includes inter RIR. We do not on our side. Uh, we did discuss this and we ran into some technical issues about implementing the actual inter RIR transfer of ASNs and decided to back away from it for the time being. But it's probably something we should consider or at least help AP NIC help their customers to realize that we don't catch those transfer requests. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. All right, thank you very much. It's Kevin. Does this work? There. Kevin Bloomberg, the wire NAC. I believe we had the 8.4 discussion already, and I believe paraphrasing a um, uh, gentleman from AP Nick, it was um, we put it in because we thought the Aaron community would want it. Um, but when we discussed from a technical point of view and the merits point of view as a community the last time, it was this is a really bad idea uh, because of a number of uh, logistical and whatever, and it wasn't worth doing given the. Um, vast number of uh, four-byte ASs that are available to the community. Um, so I do remember that. Um, just in terms of uh, um, one of the issues, well, two things. One, spam complaints. Um, my only concern is you're saying Aaron has data and is opting not to provide that data at all. So I guess that's the question. If you're collecting information, you have the information, you see the information, not putting a spin on it, but just giving the, bl the blank or the black and white of the data that you have. Um, is Are, that better than holding data that you then, I guess it's more of a, a, a legal and more a, a moral question. If you have the data, why aren't you providing it, even in just black and white without? And, and for clarity, you're speaking to this on the screen right now, 8.3 recipient complaints. This, yes. Okay. So. So 
We have some data. Our data is neither exhaustive nor complete. Um, and so it's very difficult to say what we're providing is useful. If we say we don't see an impairment to a block, it might very well be impaired. If we say we see a block is impaired, it might very well be not. So it puts us in a very difficult situation um, and the, the implication of providing that data, even though we can sit here and completely disclaim it to someone requesting address space, they're going to have assumptions about what they hear from Aaron as authoritative. And so we just need to be extremely careful. So based on that, then I guess Mr. Schiller's response uh, probably holds true. So <clears throat> it's Vince Cerf uh, from Google. A couple of thoughts. The first one uh, is whether notification of the assignment of a block is in some way helpful uh, to parties who are known to be uh, managing block tables. Do we do any kind of notification or do we tell them they can look on a regular basis at new assignments? Um, sometimes it does happen that the customer themselves will contact one of these spam mitigation providers and let them know I am a new registrant and that organization will contact Aaron and ask for verification that that's the case and we will tell them yes it is the case that we have recently transferred that from one party to another party and we'll give them that information and sometimes they have lifted it um, other times they've had issues because and I and I do want to mention this is that um, some organizations who are using their IPv4 address space to do activities that would get them on a block list, they have found that for 500 US dollars, they can transfer the address space from the entity that's on the block list to a new entity that is still them, contact the spam mitigation provider, let them know that, hey, I just got this space and I'm being harmed by it. And they'll contact Aaron, we'll tell them, yes, it's a new registrant and there was a transfer, and then they will continue with their normal activities so this is why we can't have nice things applies. So if, if you permit, um, at the very least, a simple notification of the transfer uh, seems like it's something that we could do voluntarily, even if the interpretation is going to vary. Yes, sir. And we do confirm when asked, if they come to us, most of the responsible ones follow our issued reports, our daily reports of addresses that are issued and transferred. And so um, some of them have no problem, but they also are concerned with that very case where uh, if, if three spammers all transfer A to B, B to C, C to A, everyone's happy and we all have clean addresses. And so this is a, a situation where the historical practice of, of blocking an IP address block was predicated upon the fact that these weren't being moved around. I want to get back in the queue, but you have people waiting. Back microphone. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Chris Woodfield, Twitter. Um, I'm curious, you know, regarding the whole the, the blacklisting issue, um, has an explicit lack of warranty for the quality of, the quality of IPv4 space ever been considered as part of Aaron policy? Aaron's responsible for providing unique address blocks, and that includes handling the transfers of those rights between parties, the usage of an address block, the appearance of an address block on someone's filter list of any type of filter isn't in Aaron's control. Now it could be. You could all turn around and contractually say, I want Aaron to handle this and I give Aaron the right to control what I put in my filter list and I will enforce mm -hmm. that. But that would require a different world than we're in because right now we're just a registry. I, you know that, I know that. The question I have is, has it, ever, has it ever been considered to explicitly state in the policy that Aaron does not make any warranty as to the, whether or not this space is going to be filtered by anybody? We, we tell people that when we assign the issue them the information, we tell them this block's been transferred, we can't talk about its pedigree, we don't know. But again, that doesn't prevent them from coming back when they discover <laughs> it's a problem. This is a... Um, I'm not saying it's an intractable problem, but to the extent that there are block lists operating on the internet, mm -hmm. um, it's, those are operating in a time that 
presumed different assumptions about address space. Understood. Front microphone. Owen DeLong, Aaron AC. Um, you mentioned a scenario where A to B, B to C, C to A. Given the hold downs that are in 8.2 or 8.3 rather for um, the time between being a recipient and being a provider, uh, shouldn't that be not possible? So it doesn't have to be as direct. A company finds its address list blocked. Its friendly subsidiary or a, a unaffiliated, we can't see it's affiliated, the same parties form a new corporation and they end up getting address space from the prior one doing a transfer. When that happens, there's no way for us to know legally there's a, that it's the same spamming company under another name. When that happens and the transfer appears, it looks just like a transfer to a new organization. And so anything we do to encourage the removal of that from a block list could easily be re-enabling a spammer. Now, the fact that the same principles have now received address space under a new company name, well, yeah, there's a hold down, but they can always form another company and do it again. And you can get a ring of these going that exceeds the timeout and the hold downs. And, and I, would, I would just like to add that uh, typically what we'll see they'll do is they'll come from a 16 and they'll dole out 24s or 23s at a time uh, we understand that we respect the 12-month lockout on, on the recycling, but they're, they're doing it in small pieces. Got it. Okay. Um, and there was one issue I forgot to address, the, um, the transfer uh, tie-up where they're trying to unload a 16 and pick up a 23. Um, yeah, that's going to that's gonna require some thought, but I think that the solution is probably to enable some sort of escrow transaction with Aaron acting as the escrow agent where the two blocks come in and then they leave at the same time. Thank you. And uh, event, I think you were next in line. I wasn't keeping that close track. Uh, I, I was very interested in this problem of someone with a slash 16 trying to transfer it but needing a slash 24 in order to continue operation. Um, is there any already any kind of a vision for a sort of an escrow arrangement where they transfer the slash 16 to Aaron, for example, and Aaron in exchange for that transfers the slash 24 and then the 16 goes to the designated party. So um, there are escrow parties operating in the IP address space range. They're used by people doing transfers. It's common for funds to be escrowed. We don't have people doing escrow of IP address blocks. It's also true that uh, escrow of IP address blocks doesn't solve the problem when the policy constraints would prevent someone who received address space from doing a subsequent transfer. This is a case where even if you had an escrow agent, which is just a party that protects the transaction, the lockdowns on a party receiving addressing doing a subsequent transfer get in the way of that particular swap. Uh, in that case, it sounds like there's room for some rethinking of how to solve that particular uh, rear microphone. Rob Seastrom, Aaron AC. Could we flip back to the slide about the complaints about 8.3 transfers? I'm kind of fascinated that Aaron is getting any of these complaints at all. It sort of uh, harkens back to get, getting complaints to the mailing list address policy from people who, who uh, uh, have mistaken Aaron for the internet police. There are three things that go along with an address block transfer. One of them I'll call provenance, meaning the legitimacy of the person, of the transferor to offer it for transfer. That's in Aaron's wheelhouse. Pedigree, which John talked about before, which is, is this on every RBL in the known universe because it's inhabited by a nest of spammers? And then there's merchantability or fitness for a purpose. And it seems to me that this should be in the contract between the, uh, um, between the, the recipient and the broker. And that this is a simple, you know, if, if, the, if the customer wants a do-over on this and hand the address space back in some way, that maybe that's something that Aaron could have something in space to facilitate because, hey, there was a contract issue here with the broker. 
But this this seems to be, hey, you're paying the broker some money as well as the as the transferor. You know, the broker's doing their due diligence. It's like buying a used car. So I, I'd very much like to see Aaron involved in this as little as humanly possible. Uh, we fully agree with that. That's been our position. I'll note, though, be clear. Um, the people who are doing transfers, when the rights to the address block transfer, when the registry is updated, the rights are transferred. What you're talking about is the merchantability, and even in transfers that happen today of other things, such as buildings and property, often... It's a caveat emptor. The person receiving is responsible for doing their due diligence. It doesn't impact the transfer. And often, it's not even a condition of the transfer. It's, it's something the, that the, the buyer must beware. And so I, uh, I understand what you're saying. I, I agree, in fact, to the role you talk about for Aaron. But I'm not even sure it would ever be a condition of transfer. It's really a warning for someone to look at the, the suitability of whatever they're requiring. Thank you. Rear mic. Um, Alain Durand, I can speak on my own behalf, not on I can behalf. Uh, I wanted to follow up on the comment from Vincent to publish when there's a transfer so that people could know outside. Uh, I would like to make the observation that if you look at the statistics published by Aaron, there's only the block that is being published as transfers, and you have the list of all blocks by date while other IRR are publishing more information, where it's coming from, where it's going to, what was the previous date of allocation or assignment, and many other data. So when you're looking at this from the outside, uh, I look at the five IRRs, and well, actually three of them have transferred now, but those three who have transfers have different published statistics that doesn't really help. And any cooperation between the different IRR to have a complete set of data will be certainly useful for those of us like me who are looking at that space. Agreed. At the end, people have to remember that the address block is only the entry in the registry, and there's a lot of other information that is germane to its suitability for any purpose, including the information that's, whether it's on spam lists, how it's been routed in the past, etc. The registry's role uh, begins and ends with the address block, not its usage in the internet. Hi, Amy Potter, Hilco Stream Bank. So I broker these regularly. And just so everyone's aware, the standard process that people go through is that there's a period of diligence prior to entering into the contract. So people get to a chance to review the space, check out blacklists, and satisfy themselves prior to paying any money, prior to signing a contract to go through that transfer. And so if the parties aren't conducting sufficient diligence and find out after the case, I'm really not sure how that's any of Aaron's responsibility. It is, it is my understanding that people who are acquiring address block rights are always doing so with visibility into the block before they put a, uh, before they consummate a transaction. Uh, I don't know of any place where people are uh, putting down a price blind and getting the block assigned that they are, that is assigned unseen. So it should be capable for anyone to do due diligence on what they're putting an offer in on. Now, Alain Durand, again, responding to John. Um, we just have had transfers, but there's most probably in the future being retransfers of those resources to other parties. And um, it would be difficult today with the data that is published to trace back those transfers to what was the original block. And um, that's why I would like to appeal to have more data made available. Jason Schiller, Google, ASO, AC. It's not clear to me the level of due diligence you can actually do until you route the block and try to actually use it. Um, certainly you can discover if it's blacklisted on some well-known published lists, but who knows what crazy routing and filtering policies people have on the internet. Um, gosh, I'm sorry somebody doesn't like to route IPs that have the number six in them. There's not much that you can tell until you actually try to route it and find out that someone is downstream from them and can't reach you. Um, that being said, I, I still think Aaron's role here is fairly limited. Um, I did like RS's suggestion of allowing them to do a do-over. 
uh, if I was an organization that was approved for a slash 24 transfer within the next 24 months, and I wait 12 months until I find the right block and get my contract sorted out and pay the money, and I get the block, and I complete the transfer, and it's registered to me, and I go to use it, and I go, oh boy, I can't use this. I'm going to turn around and return the block to who I got it from, saying, please untransfer it to me, and reinstitute my slash 24 pre-approval for the remainder of the 12 months that's left on that clock. I would, I would certainly be in support of that approach. So I, I'm not aware of a case where we've had someone request an untransfer of an address block. We understand, people understand that once we've transferred, it's transferred, that they would be in a subsequent transfer mode. And I think the thing that needs to be reminded is exactly what we talked about with due diligence. When you are been approved and you're out there looking for an address block and you're six months in and someone shows up and says, I found one and here's the price, it's very much incumbent upon you before you consummate to, to pay attention to that. Uh, NRPM, Aaron, uh, in the number of resource policy meeting, we say we cannot provide or assure any form of routability, okay, in 1.3. We don't control it. So the, I don't have, I don't, I'm not aware of parties that have come and said, I've transferred it, it's a turkey, I don't want it now. Um, but we have had people come back and said, I've transferred it, it's a turkey, can I do anything about it? And our answer is, caveat emptor. Really, you have acquired the block and its usability was whatever it was when you acquired it. We have another comment from Dan. Dan Alexander, Aaron AC. Just for clarification, last policy experience report in October, there was a scenario you laid out about market swapping where ISPs were trading networks and the, the one network wanted to give up space but needed something in replacement. Is this along those lines or is this distinctly a different scenario that we have to consider? This is a distinctly different scenario. In, in the other case, in the last policy experience report, it's where two organizations wanted to swap with no net change on either side, the address space. And we stated that we would consider those on a case-by-case -case basis and allow it unless we were told otherwise by the policy committee not to do so. Uh, but but this, this does certainly have some differences, and I'd be glad to talk to you about them. Okay. Uh, Kevin Bloomberg. So uh, in regards to this, is it a situation where they're looking for a new block? We're going to give out our, we're going to give our slash 16 wholly, or are, is it also a situation where they're saying we're going to give out and keep a 23 out of the 16. So, so what this is, is they have a 16, somebody wants it, so they're gonna provide that through the market to them and they're gonna have it transferred at Aaron. They tell the person who's taking it from them, I would like to keep a 24 out of this 16. The person receiving it says, no, I don't want 255 24s, I want 256 of them. It's the whole thing or nothing. Right. And so then they're faced with having to go find a 24 themselves and that's the issue here. And they don't, because they're not familiar with the policy community and that they have less trust perhaps, they don't trust that after they release their 16 to the other party that they'll be able to get the 24 back. And we convince them of that when they come and they talk to us, but we're concerned about those people who aren't approaching us and talking to us about it. The, the scenario in case is that anyone who has meaningful usage of that slash 16 will have no difficulty qualifying to obtain a 24 and transfer that from someone once they lose the 16 because they'll have a large amount of, you know, any meaningful usage of a 16 is going to be more than the requirements to meet a 24. The problem is, while we know that, and we all understand how this works, someone looks at the policies and says, I don't know what happens if I transfer the 16 and I don't qualify for the 24. And while we know that to be a de minimis risk for someone uninitiated to the policy process, they see how they could somehow be left without any address space. So the last question to that is, right now, are you saying that the qualification is a binary, zero and one scenario, um, where you aren't able to put caveats in uh, so that um, the, things like that? Correct, correct. So, so when the organization comes to us, before they transfer the 16 and let it go, they come to Aaron and they say, you know what, can I pre-qualify, because we have that service, can I pre-qualify for a slash 24? And when they do that, we are required as staff to look at the utilization of their previous blocks. 
we find that there is a fully unused 16 with the exception of a 24 and they want to qualify for another 24 and we tell them no. And then they say, well, can we put a condition on that? We're going to transfer it later. And we tell them, unfortunately, no, we don't currently do that. However, we assure them that if they do transfer the space, they would be able to qualify for the 24. Our concern is um, people may do this. We, we do accept a condition. And then they later never transfer the space but receive the new space. Um, so that is an issue for them. Right. And additionally, while we can tell them it's our understanding based on what we've been told that you won't have any problem, us saying that is not the same as a legal document, which is a prequalification, that they want to have for purposes of consummating their other transaction. And a lot of times there are more lawyers involved now than one might imagine, and they want to tie all the loose ends up before they do the transaction. Our reassurances, our assurances that they obviously would qualify based on the utilization is not the same as performing a prequalification, and we can't prequalify them as long as they're registered with that 16. Simply we can't. Rear microphone. Jason Chandler, Google, ASOAC. What is preventing Aaron from doing a prequalification contingent on the transfer of the slash 16? And given current utilization remains true once the 16 is transferred. You're, you're saying, do we do hypothetical prequalifications? We do not at present. Well, we only do qualifications based on your actual address holdings. It's, it's not hypothetical. I mean, th this is a renumbering event. And there are other cases where Aaron has given IP space in order to complete a renumbering event, at the conclusion of which they're going to return some addresses and be efficiently utilized. For example, I'm an organization that has a slash 24 from my upstream provider. I'm now 86% utilized. And I've gone from 0% utilization to 80%, 86% in the last 45 days. Can I please get a slash 23? Oh, and by the way, I'm going to give the slash 24 back to my upstream. Right. And so that's in, the, in a situation where we understand all of the factors that apply when someone comes in. When someone's coming in and they have a 16 and they indicate that they may release it but they'd like to be pre-qualified for 24, we have never received any guidance from the community. This is not an amnesty process or an exchange process or a case where someone's qualifying because of their existing sub-delegation from an ISP, all of which were in an RPM, okay? We do qualifications based on what's in our RPM, and it specifically notes that we can do that when someone has upstream allocation and use that for purposes of determining their need to issue address space. We don't have any guidance in an RPM that says we can approve someone for a transfer based on their potential release or subsequent transfer to another party. So if you're saying we should be doing that, I get a little nervous because that opens the box to us doing pre-qualifications. Well, what if I have an option contract? What if I have a lease of address space? What if I have, we don't know where that would lead. If you want us doing pre-qualifications based on this, we'd prefer policy guidance. Okay, thank you. Well said, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Richard.